The claim, of course, also was that uh, Assad was a brutal dictator who was repressing his own people, killing his own people for some unexplained reason. But the lie is given to that by the public opinion polls carried out during the war. Now, these opinion polls were not just the elections held in Syria or the polls held in Syria. They were polls held by Syria's enemies, those who were actually uh, arming the sectarian Islamists against Syria. For example, um, Al Jazeera, Qatar, for example, um, Turkey. There was an independent pollster in Turkey. There were so-called rebel leaders in Aleppo who were being interviewed by the Western media. There was a NATO consultant. And if you look at the table on the top right there, you can see that just before the armed insurrection in Dara in February 2011, uh, Al Jazeera published a lead article saying that the revolution in Syria was unlikely due to Assad's popularity. Um, similarly, a, a Tesev poll in late 2011, published in early 2012, um, polled Syrian people about, they were looking at the influence of Turkey in the region really, but along the way they asked people in Syria, um, would they support violent protest against the government? And 5% or less said that they would. So there was a very small base of uh, popular support for sectarian Islamists at that time, as measured by a Turkish organization, which was clearly not uh, compromised by any pro-Syrian stance. At the end of 2011, a, a very skewed poll <clears throat> aimed at the, the readers, or at least people who had been following uh, the Qatari media, the Doha Debates Forum, asked whether Assad should stay, and a slim majority said yes. So even in a very biased poll, by one of uh, Syria's key enemies at that time, uh, Qatar, later on Qatari officials admitted that they their state had poured billions of dollars into the sectarian groups <clears throat> waging a so-called revolution in Syria. Even a poll organised within their own ranks found a majority wanted the Syrian president to stay. In mid-2012, when large numbers of international so-called jihadists had come into northern Syria through Turkey. Uh, some of them were interviewed in Aleppo when they held parts of that big city by Western media. In this case, I think it was by a uh, Newsweek. Um, and the rebel leaders there were complaining that the population of Aleppo, which is largely a Sunni Muslim city, was overwhelmingly supporting Assad and the Syrian army. And they were complaining that the civilians were informing against them at that time. And of course, Having the population against you is fatal to a revolution, but if you're a religious fanatic, it's just inconvenient. So they said we would have lost a long time ago if God didn't support us, basically. So one of them said 70%, others were saying almost all of them supported the Syrian army and were informing against the so-called rebels to the Syrian army. And just before the uh, presidential elections of 2014, um, NATO got a consultant's report to say what sort of support does uh, Assad have in Syria. And at that stage, uh, the consultant estimated around 70%. So that, of course, led to a number of articles. There was one in the British media um, by Jonathan Steele saying well, most of the Syrians back President Assad. Of course, this would not happen if he was killing civilians randomly, attacking schools and hospitals the way that the Western media said. So there was a huge gap between what the Western media said about Syria and the reality there. Um, here's um, some headlines from those reports that I mentioned. When the US uh, re-entered Iraq after ISIS had been beefed up largely from Saudi support because ISIS properly understood is really a, a little uh, version of Saudi Arabia, <clears throat> with the same sectarian ideology, the same brutality, the same religious fanaticism, although a great deal of it is due to mercenary members, basically. But the threat of ISIS in Iraq led um, the US to force its way back into Iraq, having left in 2011. Um, it had become obvious at that stage that the role of the Saudis and Qatar and Turkey in supporting ISIS and those sectarian groups was uh, very prominent. And so senior US officials made the best of a bad situation and began to admit that their allies were responsible for the arming and the funding of these sectarian Islamist groups, but trying to uh, 
maintain the position that the US was at arm's length from its allies, which of course is ridiculous that the US never arms any ally and then allows them to pass weapons on to groups it thinks will act against its interests. The fact of the matter is that the US clearly thought, we know now from all these admissions, that these sectarian groups were going to help it in its regime change project against Damascus at that time. We know that from several sources. One is that the USDIA, a, a intelligence agency, um, one of its reports from August 2012 was leaked, which pointed out that the major forces of the armed insurgency, even though the Western media was saying these were moderate rebels, were extremists. They were Salafists, the Muslim Brotherhood, Al-Qaeda in Iraq, the major forces driving the insurgency. Second, the West, uh, quote unquote, and the Gulf regime support those extremists. And third, a Salafist principality, in other words, an Islamic state, a sectarian Islamic state, um, Salafism being an extreme sectarian version of, of Islam, in Eastern Syria is exactly what the Western powers want. Now, Vice President Joe Biden, two years later on, um, and uh, head of, then head of the army, Martin Dempsey, admitted that their allies in the region were funding and arming all of these mass terrorist groups there. Biden's quote was, our allies in the region, Turks, the Saudis, Emiratis, were so determined to take down Assad that they were doing it because the US was behind them in that. They poured hundreds of millions of dollars and thousands of tons of weapons into anyone who would fight against Assad. That is al-Nusra and al-Qaeda and the extremist elements of jihadis coming from other parts of the world, including this outfit called ISIL, or ISIS or Daesh in the Arab speaking world. Let's have a look at some video from these admissions about who was behind the mass terrorism in Syria. We must use what has been called smart power, the full range of tools at our disposal, diplomatic, economic, military, political, legal, and cultural. The administration turned a blind eye to your analysis. I don't know if they turned a blind eye. I think it was a decision. I think it was a willful decision. A willful decision to go support an insurgency that had Salafists, Al-Qaeda, well, and Muslim Brotherhood. a willful decision to do what they're doing. It really comes down to building a coalition so that, that what the Arab Muslim world sees is them rejecting ISIS, not They already reject them. ISIL. Do you know any major Arab ally that embraces ISIL? I know major Arab allies who fund them. Yeah, but did they embrace that? They fund them because the Free Syrian Army couldn't fight Assad. They were trying to beat Assad. I think they realized the folly of their ways. Our allies in the region were our largest problem in Syria. The Turks were great friends, and I have a great relationship with Erdogan, which I've just spent a lot of time with. The Saudis, the Emiratis, etc. What were they doing? They were so determined to take down Assad and essentially have a proxy Sunni Shia war, what did they do? They poured hundreds of millions of dollars and tens, thousands of tons of weapons into anyone who would fight against Assad. Except that the people who were being, who were being supplied were al-Nusra and al-Qaeda and the extremist elements of jihadis coming from other parts of the world. Now, normalizing mass terrorism was a key to the so-called smart power of the 21st century, particularly argued by the liberal side of the US establishment there. Um, the Saudi styled ISIL, ISIS Daesh came across to Syria from Iraq and in from Turkey, assisted by the US. Um, but al-Nusra was just as vicious before ISIS came across. They took civilians hostage. They killed them if, if they were collaborating with the government or if they were with one of the minor, minority sects that was identified with the government, the Druze, the Alawis, the Christians, or in cases they also uh, tried to drive the Christians across to Lebanon. The US media over years of this war tried to rebrand Jabhat al-Nusra or uh, HTS, Hayat Tahrir al-Sham, Al-Qaeda in Western Syria as moderate rebels. In fact, in 2021, they've dressed up the Al-Qaeda leader in the suit and interviewed him by, with PBS to try and um, rehabilit rehabilitate his image and to hide the atrocities that group was responsible for over many, many years. Even with ISIS, which the US claimed as its member, 
uh, as its sorry as its enemy, as its nemesis in the region, and a rationale for entering Syria without any invitation from the Syrian government and Iraq at one stage with the invitation of the Iraqi government. Uh, U.S. journals were trying to argue that ISIS fighters were democratic, that they were running a democracy jihad, as um, a foreign affairs magazine article point, uh, argued in January 2015, why ISIS fighters support the vote with a picture of those uh, throat cutters and head choppers walking across a field of flowers in Iraq. So this normalization was part of the massaging of the Western media, really uh, not so much perhaps to convince them, but to play down any possible reaction against the war. And in many respects, we have to admit it succeeded. There's been surprisingly muted response from Western audiences against the shocking wars in the Middle East, with the exception of those very obvious invasions. Propaganda teams were funded and set up, um, so-called media activists, um, the, you know, the Guta media team, the Aleppo media team, um, Bellingcat, uh, the Syria campaign, a wide range of groups to argue the case for this illegal humanitarian war. One in particular, the US-UK funded White Helmets, recipients of more than $100 million in outside funding while they claimed they were some independent group set up by a British mercenary, former army guy. They occupied parts of Syria, just those areas where the Al-Qaeda groups were. And they had their own media team with them, paid by Western governments to enact scenes to show alleged Syrian government atrocities and so therefore try and ramp up the the case for Syria, a direct Western intervention. Foremost uh, amongst them were these white helmets, um, supposedly rescuing children. But you see in the graph at the, at the right there, on one occasion, they had, they had their members rescuing the same girl three times in three months, in August, in September, and in October 2016, this girl wearing the same clothes was kept being rescued from the rubble there. They were staging many of these things, showing themselves like the graphic on the left there as rescuing children and being heroes of war. Uh, Hollywood films were made of them. They were even nominated for the, the Nobel Prize. Yet uh, they were exposed many, many times against significant Western media um, resistance to this day <clears throat> as being deeply embedded with the Al Qaeda groups. As the, as the the middle graphic shows, <clears throat> uh, demonstrating with Al Qaeda groups, with weapons in their hands, with the flag of Jabhat al Nusra, the the, the Al Qaeda flag, uh, and also engaged in body disposal for the executions of those groups there. So here is another brief video to point out the the links between the White Helmets and the Al Qaeda groups in Syria. The Syrian first responders who risk their lives to save others in war-torn Aleppo. In the face of unrelenting brutality, heroes have emerged. They have all chosen to risk their lives to save others. Making the Syrian civil defense a candidate for the Nobel Peace Prize. <laughs> I'm proud to say we're giving them uh, another, I think, 32 million pounds of funding as part of a wider uh, 65 million pound package. We yeah. provide through USAID about $23 million in assistance uh, to them. Another important element of the propaganda war against Syria across the decade was the constant claims of chemical weapons used by the Syrian army, which the Syrian government and army had always denied using. Um, now, this is a long story, which I've detailed in two of my books, Axis of Resistance, Chapter 8, and also The Dirty War on Syria. But just briefly to sum it up, um, sarin gas, which is banned under UN conventions, was first used by Jabhat al-Nusra, the Al-Qaeda group 
backed by the NATO powers against Syrian soldiers and civilians at Khan al-Assal in early 2013. This was reported in the Western media at the time, and Jabhat al-Nusra members were arrested in possession of sarin at Adana in Turkey in early 2013. Yet from later in 2013 through to 2018, uh, that same terror group, Jabhat al-Nusra, blamed the Syrian government for using chemical weapons against civilians. And the Western governments and the media repeated their story. Now, the key problem here was that independent evidence always discredited those claims. Like the evidence from Ted Postol in over the 2013 incident in East Ghouta, um, through to the fake um, attack in Douma in 2018, carried out in areas controlled by the sectarian Islamist groups who had no compunction about killing their hostages, about killing civilians, <clears throat> but had a great interest in trying to uh, demonize the Syrian army to attract Western intervention. Um, there was never a credible military objective for these sorts of attacks that were usually done when the gangs were on their back foot and wanted some uh, Western intervention. Um, in more recent years, the issue led to a scandal at the, the United Nations Organization for the Control of Chemical Weapons, where a number of internal whistleblowers came out to accuse managers of fabricating evidence. And quite a bit's been written about that, and I've given some references there. But let's look at a brief video from a former British military chief, Lord West, pointing out the ridiculousness of these constant claims, really a second version of this weapons of mass destruction uh, as used against Iraq for the invasion in 2003. Here's Lord West, I think it's in 2018. Yes, uh, President Assad is uh, in the process of winning this civil war um, and he was about to take over and occupy Duma, all that area. He'd had a, a long, long, hard slog slowly capturing that whole area of the city and there just before he goes in and takes it all over apparently he decides to have a chemical attack it just doesn't ring true it seems extraordinary because clearly he would know that there's likely to be a response from the from the allies um, what what benefit is there for his military um, most of the uh, rebel fighters um, this disparate group of Islamists had withdrawn. There were a few women and children left around. What, what benefit was there militarily in doing what he did? I find that extraordinary. Whereas we know that in the past some of the Islamic groups have used chemicals and of course there would be huge benefit in them um, labelling an attack as coming from Assad because they would guess quite rightly that there'd be a response from the US as there was last time and possibly from the UK and France. Now, in 2015, September 2015, uh, due to a, an organized response from Iran and Russia together, there was a direct, a more direct intervention by Russian air power in the dirty war in Syria. So in other words, Russia and Iran began to, began to engage more directly to defend Syria because of the turn of events. Now, the first four years of that war through to 2015, the Syrian army assisted directly really only by Lebanon's Hezbollah, the resistance group in southern Lebanon, which had effectively kicked Israel out of, out of occupied southern Lebanon. They worked together to liberate most of Western Syria, but there were counter offensives from the Northwest, from Turkey and from the East, from Iraq, where uh, the Al Qaeda groups came into Idlib and came across the Eastern desert into Palmyra and reclaimed ground there. So in other words, um, Syria was making heavy work of reclaiming its territory from these terrorist groups. So in September 2015, Russian air power was invited by the Syrian government legally and Iranian ground support also came into Syria. There was a more coordinated response and the results were showed up fairly quickly, not just in military terms, but also in media terms. The, Russia, the Russian media, of course, had a much stronger voice than the Syrian media. So one of the things that the Russian intervention in 2015 did, in late 2015, was to expose the collaboration between Turkey and ISIS in the theft of Syrian oil. That was very important for the global propaganda war, which was, of course, aimed at demonizing Syria and trying to minimize any opposition to the war and to the occupation of Syria. 
So Palmyra and Aleppo were liberated through the course of 2016, Aleppo being Syria's biggest city. Deir was liberated later in 2017, and Iranian General Soleimani declared the region free of ISIS or Daesh at the end of uh, 2017, in November 2017. Now, that was very important because Soleimani was speaking not just as a Iranian general at that time, but as a general of the resistance against NATO-backed, Washington-backed terrorism in the region. There had been attacks in Lebanon, in Syria, in Iraq, attacks on Iran, and those groups had also been ported into Yemen, which I'll come to in a moment. So this was the beginnings of the sign of a military response to the massive proxy wars being carried out in the region. So uh, ISIS was not completely eliminated, but it was eliminated from all the cities and major towns by late 2017, although the US was claiming credit for it at this time, the then President Donald Trump. The, in Syria, the East Ghouta area and Dara, which had been occupied by these groups for years, were liberated in early 2018. So all of these, the, the members of those groups who would not submit to a reconciliation process, that is to say an amnesty, where they had to be under some sort of surveillance, some of them joined uh, the, the reserve uh, militia to protect certain areas. Those who would not submit to this reconciliation process were sent up to Northwest Syria, to Idlib, um, and the White Helmets were embedded with them in the south, were evacuated by Israel um, to other Western countries or back to where they came from. So this was, there were very important uh, advances then made by Syria with the backing of Iran and Russia between 2015 and 2018, which led to the point that there were no major areas except Idlib and the areas actually occupied by foreign governments, um, which were continuing to provide safe haven to these groups. Another pretext used to help divide and rule Syria was um, the rather cynical exploitation of a Turkish Kurd dream of having a large Kurdistan area between Turkey, Syria and uh, Iraq. Um, there are also Kurdish populations in Iran, which is where a lot of the Kurdish populations historically come from. But the idea of a Syrian Kurdistan was something that was not particularly strong within Syrian Kurdish culture. Indeed, maybe the, at the most, a third of Syrian Kurds supported that. Kurds have had a prominent place in Syrian nationalism and Syrian socialism for a very long time. But of course, with the biggest Kurdish population in, uh, in Turkey and with their ambition to have a foothold on the border of Turkey, um, they were co-opted by the US as a partner to help divide and rule Syria. So Washington's divide and rule plan added this separate Kurdish force, which they named the Syrian Democratic Forces from something that had been called the YPG before that. And um, having directly invaded East and North Syria from Iraq, a US occupation, an illegal occupation, of course, created this group from the existing YPG. Um, it wasn't a indigenous self-determination movement. Kurds in the region were always a minority, still a minority in the large cities of that uh, yellow painted area there in the top right of the graphic there. Um, Kurds are a tiny minority in Mumbij, a larger minority in Hasaka, a tiny minority in Raqqa and Derizur. So it's really an artificial type of process to um, make a type of Israeli partition there to weaken Damascus, to weaken um, Baghdad also there. Uh, it was exploited cynically by the US. Some of the officials told them directly, don't trust us. We will, you know, we will never support you at the end. Um, but nevertheless, um, it's something that persists to this day. It has no support, the idea of a separatist Kurdish enclave in Syria from anyone in the region apart from Israel. So uh, in more recent times, in 2021, the, there are popular protests against this SDF rule or Kurdish rule in those cities like Derizur, Raqqa and Mumbij. And it's only really the uh, relatively small, but of course symbolically influential US occupation of Northeast Syria 
maybe there's only a thousand US troops in the area there uh, that deter any direct attack by Syrian forces. Um, but that uh, Kurdish uh, rule will collapse very quickly um, when the US occupation eventually leaves. So at the end of this decade of dirty war on Syria, we have um, a situation where, as some Syrian military leaders have said, the US knows that it's lost. It knows that we know that it lost, but it's continuing with this process to try and punish the Syrian people with the economic war, with the siege, which is most intense, and with a triple occupation uh, and insistent propaganda. So that is to say, there is a Turkish occupation of uh, parts of Northwest and North Syria in purple in the graphic at the top right there. The US is occupying important parts of Northeast and East Syria and also South Syria, the Al Tanf border region between Iraq and Syria and um, Iraq and Jordan and Syria. And of course, there's the 50 year long Israeli occupation of the Syrian Jolan, which Syria, of course, still reclaims and at the right time is going to reclaim it directly from the Israeli occupation there. The propaganda continues, Assad is killing civilians, but it's sounding more and more hollow as the minority of Western critics are becoming a tiny minority to a larger minority and Syria itself refuses to fracture. You still have diplomats like the, the British diplomat Karen Pierce in the bottom right there saying, oh, there is a war in Syria because the Syrian government attacks its own people, pure and simple. Pure and simple lies, which of course the polls about Assad's popularity and the huge participation in the presidential elections in May 2021 affirms. And of course, it is the level of participation in these elections that everyone recognises the most important feature these days. Of course, if this man had been killing his own people for a decade, there's no way, of course, that they would turn out to vote and he would still be in office. With Palestine and Yemen under direct blockade, there are, however, this, this economic war, this siege, these unilateral coercive measures, wrongly called sanctions, which suggest some sort of judicial measure, which are strangling the Syrian, the Iraqi, the Lebanese, the Iranian economies. Um, that, of course, is having the counterintuitive impact of strengthening the relationships between those countries and between those countries and their larger um, the larger regional powers, China and Russia in particular. Um, however, the, the failure of this war against Syria is leading in the first instance for the regional players to change their positions. So states like the, the Emirates, Bahrain and the Saudis, despite their um, more open relationships with Israel, which of course is the core of the corrosive um, New Middle East war here, they are talking to Damascus and normalizing or semi-normalizing semi their positions with Damascus because they see what's coming down the track and they don't want to be isolated themselves. So there is the, the situation after a decade of dirty war on Syria. Let's look briefly at the war on Yemen, which as I said, is the only successful revolution of the Arab Spring. An Ansarallah led coalition, Ansarallah is sometimes despectively called the Houthis because it's a important family within Ansarallah. It's a coalition which formed government in the capital in 2014. There's a brief history there, which I won't repeat, but it's on the screen there, a recent chronology of how Yemen got unified again. Um, a vice president, Hadi, was imposed um, with the backing of Saudi Arabia to try and repartition the country. He had no real mandate. There was a type of referendum which um, uh, accepted him for a, a short period of time there. The Saudis, backed by other Persian Gulf states and the US, however, have tried to perpetuate the myth that Hadi is still the president of Yemen after all these years and there's no real mandate for it. Unfortunately, that affects the UN processes about Yemen there too. So the US and Saudis are pressing this fiction of a Hadi government. Hadi himself has been under some sort of house arrest in the Saudi capital for some years. And that has led to the Western powers helping enforce the blockade on Yemen, which has led to a huge humanitarian crisis. Now notice the strategic importance of Yemen at the entrance to the Red Sea. It's something which the Israelis are obsessed with, as well as the Saudis. And of course, <clears throat> Yemen is an inconvenience to this overall new Middle East plan, which does not contemplate or tolerate any sort of independent political will in the region. 
The Ansarallah movement as a religious movement of Zaydis is religiously distinct to, but strategically backed by Iran and the resistance bloc, and they increasingly see themselves as part of this resistance bloc or an axis of resistance. So Yemen joined the axis of resistance, seeing common cause in opposing the role of the US and Israel in the region. They're very clear that their key enemy is the USA, but they are hostile to Israel in the same way as the resistance elsewhere. And they've indeed documented Mossad interference or Israeli intelligence interference in the region going back uh, at least 50 years. You see their emblem, the screen, scream, it's called of Ansarallah, amongst other things says death to America, death to Israel. <clears throat> so they see the Israeli role, even though it's indirect, um, in the plot against their country. And indeed, in recent times, Israel and the Emirates have been backing the Al Qaeda groups in the south of Yemen, um, establishing spy bases and even a tourist industry on Socotra Island, which is a Yemeni territory, uh, a unique uh, world heritage, I believe, territory, but not under control of the Yemeni government in the capital, Sana'a, at this stage. The air and sea siege has led the United Nations to call Yemen the world's worst humanitarian crisis. And while the Western powers, of course, once again, the US, UK and France, they've tried to disown the war, but they've kept selling billions of dollars in weapons to the Emirates and the Saudis and have backed the, directly the, na na the naval siege there. Well, despite all of those asymmetries, because of the will of the Yemeni people, and they are not simply a, an unsophisticated people, they have their own technology, They've been helped in their technology by uh, by Iran and others, but they have their own manufacturing capacity for missiles and drones and so on. And they've they delivered a series of defeats on the on the Saudi forces and the Saudi mercenaries recruited from the whole region, including from parts of Yemen. Um, those defeats led in 2021 for the Saudis to call for a truce or a ceasefire, but unfortunately the terms are distorted by the UN Security Council resolution. 2216, as Shaleen points out in the article on the problems of a truce in Yemen there. Uh, the Ansarullah, for their part, have said they will agree to a truce if the blockade, the air and sea blockade, is lifted. Um, but unfortunately, the Western powers at the time of talking about this have not yet agreed to that. A reminder that the central role of Israel in this new Middle East. Now, Israel itself is seen as, of course, you know, it's the mythology is that it's not a colony, really. It's not a European colony. Um, it's actually some sort of return to ancestral land. Uh, but of course, it obviously involves the displacement of people who have lived on that land for many thousands of years. The boundaries of Israel have never been clearly defined. Uh, indeed, many complain that the flag itself and the biblical references to the land being between the brook of Egypt, that is to say the, the Nile and the Euphrates, really encompasses the larger part of Syria, a large part of Iraq, uh, parts of Saudi Arabia, of course, Jordan and Egypt. So there are no clear boundaries to this project there. And as um, the Israeli colony has annexed more and more territory, uh, not just in occupied Palestine, but in Syria and in Lebanon as well. Um, the Western powers have uh, sometimes criticized, but have not effectively acted against it. They've not imposed any limits on that expansion. It's been the resistance in the region that's done it. It's been the resistance in Gaza that pushed out the colonies in 2005. The resistance in Lebanon, Lebanon that pushed out the occupation of Lebanon in 2000, in the year 2000, and again in 2006, and the resistance in Syria, of course, is still aims to reclaim the occupied Jolan territories. So the obsessive Israeli attacks on Iran, Hezbollah, and Syria confirm the importance of the regional resistance network. In other words, Israel itself and the U.S. They are obsessed with the role of Iran and the alliance between the so-called Axis countries, uh, which, however, are starting to grow stronger with the inclusion gradually of Iraq into, and Yemen into this alliance. So um, in the final analysis of the new Middle East, however, a strong Israel with the Saudis and the others is still relied on by Washington for a future policing role 
in its new Middle East. Israel is the forward post of Washington's project for the Middle East, and that's why Israel itself is engaged in these constant attacks, uh, not just on the Palestinian population, but on Lebanon, on Syria, on uh, sections of the Iraqi uh, defense forces, on Iran itself, and constantly threatening war in Iran. In short, destabilizing the entire region, trying to annex and occupy parts of Yemen as well. And they've used these claims that it's some sort of self-defense to carry out these otherwise war criminal operations. Well, there's a number of papers that have talked about the, the fact that occupiers don't have this uh, right to claim self-defense as a means of advancing the defense of their colonies. The Western responses to Israel and to the new Middle East wars. There is a split, of course, in the West between those who claim to support Palestine, because Palestine and Palestinians are a very popular cause, but largely as voiceless victims. That is to say, the Western savior complex is very prone to this idea, particularly the, the liberal faction, to supporting people, supporting in their own terms. That is to say, they don't like the idea, the openly fascist Israeli faction that, for example, sells t-shirts saying one shot to kills, you know, a joke about how Israeli soldiers can kill a pregnant woman, pregnant Arab Muslim woman and kill the baby as well as the woman, or protesters holding up signs saying, kill them all, as in the graphics at the right there, when a, an Israeli was on trial for killing Palestinian civilians. These sort of genocidal ideas are ugly to Western liberals or to liberal Zionists even, who may be in a minority now within the Israeli colony itself, but remain in a majority in the Western countries that tend to support Israel. So in that sense, you have these um, Western liberals and liberal Zionists who often recognize Palestinians as victims of Israeli brutality, but they are very opposed to an attack the Palestinian resistance, which they sometimes characterize as Hamas with indiscriminate rockets and so on. I mentioned in the last module that the, the violence of the Palestinian resistance is generally mischaracterized. It is generally far more discriminate than the violence of the Israeli forces. But nevertheless, it's in a lazy way characterized as indiscriminate and simply to do with religious sectarians uh, in, within the Palestinian resistance. Those same people, of course, oppose and attack the regional resistance, Hezbollah in Lebanon, Syria, Iran, and effectively they declare a type of loyalty to the Western strategy in the region, uh, accepting the right of occupation forces to self-defense. Those who are genuinely anti-colonial in solidarity with the Palestinian resistance and the regional resistance actually do oppose all the wars of aggression, all of the new Middle East wars and the colonialism and recognize the right to resistance and self-determination. They that real solidarity rejects the claimed right of occupation forces to self-defense, and it supports the regional resistance against that colonial project and that new Middle East project. Overall, the new Middle East wars, um, the casualties have been added up in, in different ways. The most conservative estimates, the one from Brown University, from mine and, and others in 2020, have estimated 800,000 direct deaths and 3.1 million indirect deaths. But the higher estimate in the table on the right there from Davies in 2018 is that it's about 6 million deaths in those 20 years of new Middle East wars there. A massive human toll, um, what they call, what Davies calls America's post 9-11 wars, what I'm calling here the new Middle East wars. There is the ongoing economic war backed by most of the Western countries, so most of the European countries, my own country, Australia, Canada, the US, of course, at the center of it, unilateral coercive measures, wrongly termed sanctions, which unlike the UN-backed sanctions used against apartheid South Africa from the 60s through to the 80s, these unilateral coercive measures have not been gone through the processes of uh, UN approval and also consultation with the people to be affected by those sanctions. 
that happened in South Africa. It hasn't happened in any of these cases of unilateral coercive measures. Um, they're generally legal for these reasons. First of all, international law prohibits economic coercion by the principle of non-intervention, an implied ban in the UN Charter, which supports state sovereignty, supplemented by customary and treaty law in areas like trade, shipping, telecommunications. That illegality is more obvious when there's an unlawful intent, such as damaging the economy, deliberately causing damage uh, the economy of another country, or retaliation for um, political coercion. In other words, if there's a political coercion objective, that is to say re regime change, or the fragmentation of a state, that is clearly an illegitimate objective and makes the sanction or unilateral coercive measure illegal. That's the case in virtually all of these sanctions against Iran, certain sections of Iraq, Syria, certain sections of um, Lebanon, and of course the, the blockade on Palestine and Yemen. Measures which damage the rights of third parties like the so-called Caesar sanctions against Syria are also illegal. That is to say the US arrogates to itself, um, and this is mainly a, a, a US thing, um, the right to fine or penalize in some way third parties that do business with Syria in this case, but also other countries, Cuba, Venezuela, Iran, and so on. Those extensive, what are they called, maximum pressure measures against Iran also were aiming to penalize other states, third parties that do business with Iran. And, you know, the U.S. rationale is this is or the U.S. rationale against Cuba was this is trading in stolen goods or something, something of, of that sort. It's not recognized in international law. It's illegal in international law terms. So those unilateral coercive measures have proliferated so much that some years ago, the U.N. Human Rights Council adopted a resolution on human rights and unilateral coercive measures and have appointed experts to investigate these coercive measures used against several countries like Venezuela and Syria and Iran and Cuba and so on. And they've come out in a number of reports against those sanctions, um, uh, saying also at times that they're crimes against humanity. And for example, the sanctions hindering the rebuilding of Syria are uh, uh, breaches of human rights. Um, notice, by the way, that UN bodies like UNESCO have been involved in the reconstruction in Iraq to some extent, but in world heritage areas like Palmyra and Aleppo in Syria, UNESCO has been blocked by those same big powers from helping the reconstruction of world heritage areas in Syria because sour grapes from the losing players who failed to bring about regime change in Syria. These wars of aggression, of course, also lead to the serious war crimes and crimes against humanity, and that includes crimes of the collaborators. Now, in this case, my own country, Australia, its military has been involved in atrocities, and there are documented atrocities now of the war crimes by the Australian military in several of those countries of the New Middle East wars. In Iraq, in 2003, 2004, there was Australian military leadership of the twin uh, attacks on civilians and massacres in the city of Fallujah in Iraq. In Afghanistan over many years now, an official report, official Australian report came out to confirm that Australian soldiers were involved in the murder of several dozen Afghan civilians and prisoners. And in the case of Syria in 2016, the Australian Air Force was involved in the slaughter of over 120 Syrian soldiers at the um, mountain behind Deir Ezzur Airport to assist ISIS terrorists take over that mountain back at that time. And that was brushed off by the Australian government of the time as an accident. Actually, it was a carefully pre-planned operation. So these great crimes, these war crimes, in some cases, crimes against humanity, they are the children of, they are created by these wars of aggression. And unfortunately, the failures of Western populations to oppose these multiple wars of aggression, at least eight wars of aggression, which I'm terming the new Middle East wars. Naturally, there's been a reaction to these multiple wars in the region, and the principal reaction has been to create a combined resistance force um, called a, an axis of resistance. It's really, it's a play on words because the former president, George W. Bush, referred to an axis of evil, 
in terms of the independent countries facing US hegemonic ambitions. So in the region, this axis for resistance is really um, formulated, led by Iran and drawing in Syria, the resistance forces in Lebanon, um, uh, important sections of Iraq and Yemen and Palestine. So this resistance has been really to all of the wars of aggression. Every new Middle East war, as I said, has been a war of aggression and a violation of the right to self-determination. In the target countries, the debate is really not over the character of the wars, but the methods of resistance. The debate in Western countries is different. So this counter hegemonic military alliance has grown particularly since 2015 with allies as well as members of the Axis. Um, the Axis also has raised new options or future ideas about Levant or the Levant area and West Asian Federation while expanding the regional strategic and economic roles for China and Russia. And of course, this process reminds me, has to remind people who've had some experience in Latin America of the saying by the 19th century Cuban hero, Jose Marti, who said that the little countries can't fight big powers on their own. They have to come together to do it. Marti said, the trees must form ranks to keep the giant with the seven league boots from passing. And that's really something that applies in Latin America as well as in the Middle East or West Asia. So the question has been how to survive, to organize and to resist. And the idea of an axis is really those facing the US or what they call American and the Zionist threats. And their focus is on Israel as the core agency of the US presence in the region. Those other powers and allies outside may not have the same approach. Russia and China, for example, or they've become important allies don't share all the same perspectives as those uh, in the regional resistance. The key members are Iran, Palestine, Syria, Iraq, Hezbollah, and its allies in Lebanon and Yemen. And as I said before, the resistance commander, Qasem Soleimani, was seen particularly dangerous to this new Middle East plan because he represented precisely that unified axis or opposition to the, uh, the plans. The assassination of Soleimani by President Trump uh, or at President Trump's directions in January 2020 um, catalyzed a response which was very interesting. All the Palestinian factions mourned him. So they brought out into the open the very close relationship between the resistance factions in Palestine, those that are physically resisting the assaults and the ethnic cleansing um, against the, the sectarian narrative, which says that he is Shia Muslims in Iran and Sunni Muslims in Palestine. It cuts across that, of course. The Iraqi parliament demanded the expulsion of US forces and Iraq had been uh, uh, cursed with divisions and infighting and so on, but they came together in support of the role of Soleimani in supporting their independence. And the parliament passed this unanimous resolution demanding the expulsion of US forces, something which the US has resisted and hasn't yet happened. And on the other side of things, the Western media and including the social media banned sympathy for Soleimani, <clears throat> regarded in US legal terms as a dangerous person, even though it was the US that had murdered Soleimani and Soleimani was the acknowledged leader of the regional forces against ISIS, which the US claims to support or claims to be fighting. So Facebook, for example, admitted censoring posts and banning uh, numerous people because they'd supported or shown sympathy for Soleimani, including running video of the huge crowds um, at his wake, at his funeral, in Iraq, both in Iraq and in Iran. Anyway, regardless of that, the military strategic and economic links have been built between the dozens of states targeted by unilateral coercive measures, and that includes countries outside the region. So you see now more recognition internationally, if you look for it, of the ties between Cuba and Iran or Venezuela and Iran, for example, or China and Iran, which I'll come to. This Iran led resistance coalition has been recognized by many Western analysts. And I'll just give you a few references here that you might like to look up as a defensive resistance block. Um, even when the Western analysts sometimes 
using the hegemonic language, refer to the proxies of Iran's intervention. Um, it's widely recognized as a growing phenomenon. And since at least 2017, US commentators have been observing that the new Middle East is more likely to be a power block that includes Iran, Iraq, Syria, Hezbollah and Palestine, rather than a US supervised Israeli Saudi led block, for example, the axis of resistance today operates less like a patron proxy relationship and more as an Iranian led alliance centered on collective security. So there's some level of realism coming into some of the Western analyses of this, and that includes people within think tanks uh, supported by the US government, for example. Um, at another regional level, Indian commentators, quite a number of Indian commentators have noted the rising Russia, Iran, Turkey links and the role of Iran in the region, the dictates of geography, and they expect a, a future lower profile for the US in the region. So the strategic resistance responses in the first instance are to strengthen the idea of a Levant Federation or a federation in the Levant region, that is to say Palestine, Lebanon, Syria and Jordan. Um, and this is an idea that's been around for some time, but it's been renovated amongst uh, resistance forces. And this, of course, is why Israeli leaders see it, the regional resistance as such a threat. There had been earlier attempts at federations of Arab states and notably the, the United Arab Republic in 1958 and 1961. And Hafez al-Assad was uh, riven with the idea of a federation between Syria and Lebanon, and there were some modest moves towards it. Um, but the notion of a Levant federation emphasizes the permanent neighborly strategic relations between the Levant people. And it's precisely the threats from Israel in particular, but the other elements of US intervention that um, bring home this need there. So and that sort of underlies, for example, the greater support in recent years by the Lebanese people for Hezbollah in Lebanon, which itself recognizes a fairly small proportion of Lebanese people. But now there is a significant majority of Lebanese that support the idea of a resistance coalition in Lebanon itself. So the late Anis al Nakash, a Lebanese, Lebanese analyst who has been, um, let's say, renovating these ideas of a Levant Federation, wrote um, just fairly recently that the main goals of a Levant Federation should be removing Israel from existence. By that, he means dismantling the apartheid system there, that is to say, the one that denies citizenship to Palestinians, liberating the region from Western and American hegemony, networking and integrating the economic, social and intellectual capacities of the region, opening the borders between the states of the Levant for investment and cooperation. At the moment, there's a lot of barriers because of the, the divisions deliberately forced on the region by the outside powers and reviving the Levantine Confederation, not through national or sectarian hegemony, uh, but through voluntary decisions. In other words, not by the domination of one group or another, as Western an analysts, analysts are, uh, like to say. The construction constitutionally of Lebanon as a confessional state where everyone is branded with their religious community is something that, of course, Lebanon itself has yet to escape. At a slightly wider level, we have the, the resistance response of creating a West Asian alliance, which is something only modestly spoken about uh, by Iran, but necessarily it would be an Iran led alliance, which is something feared by the Israeli and US leadership um, militarily, of course, but also strategically in terms of creating infrastructure like highways, rail links, gas pipelines, those sorts of things linking Iran, Iraq, Syria and um, the Mediterranean, uh, Lebanon, potentially Palestine. Um, it's called in Israeli US intelligence terms, an Iranian land bridge. It's something that they fear, but of course, it's something that could be of great benefit to the peoples of the region, that sort of benefit that comes from infrastructure integration, which the Europeans like in their own sphere and the US wants to push in its own continent but um, they want to deny it to the peoples of West Asia. So there are some important allies now who share some of these objectives, if not all of them, that Russia, China, Venezuela, Cuba and others, for example. The likelihood of a West Asian alliance, um, not just militarily, but in infrastructure, in economy, is going to have implications in military infrastructure, finance, commerce, commerce, education and training. It already is in some of these areas to a degree. And that is the sort of threat 
that Washington's Washington's great game um, concerned with the development of new uh, poles of power, of multipolarity, or particularly Eurasian poles of power, they see that as a threat to their idea of an Arab NATO, which would have been centered on the Saudis and some of the other monarchies of the Persian Gulf. Of course, this is the dialectic of the new Middle East wars. What is seen as a threat by Washington is seen as an opportunity for the besieged resistance countries. The role of Russia and China is, of course, critically important and emphasizes for us the, the Eurasian element of this struggle. Uh, in an overarching sense, the Russian commitment to pol in multipolarity, explicit, but also Venezuela and, and some of the Latin Americans are, are very committed to this idea too, that the unipolarity of the US, the so-called basis for hegemonic stability is, is in fact a basis for an imperialism which has to be um, diffused at the least through the creation of multipolar blocks, blocks which have to be respected. That's why, of course, those regional organizations in Latin America were created uh, in recent years. Russia and China have already committed to increasing, massively increasing their trade, their strategic cooperation with Iran as the key independent player in the region. And the US dollar is soon to be undermined by the digital yuan. So these are some of the, the broader factors. Um, one analyst says, of the, the $400 billion deal between China and Iran, which was recently inked, that it's oversimplistic to call it just a an economic deal because its strategic significance will determine the future of the Middle East, he says. The most conspicuous rationale for the US-Sunni Arab-Israeli alliance is trying to stop that, trying to curtail Iranian hegemony and Chinese involvement in the region. But of course, paradoxically, it has enhanced that or catalyzed that really. Another analyst points out that Russia-Iran links will expand sectoral economic ties, mega infrastructure, weaponry, upgrading Iranian ports and modernizing the Iranian Navy. So infrastructure and military cooperation is set to shoot up rapidly. And that's of course been um, catalyzed, um, encouraged by these what were called maximum pressure economic siege measures or so-called sanctions against China and Russia because of the extreme jealousy about their role in the region, but it's really having somewhat the opposite effect. So these contradictions have emerged as a result of the aggression, the multiple wars of aggression of the new Middle East plan. Washington has not given up its attempts to obstruct the formation of new Eurasian blocs, you know, the good relations between Russia and Germany, for example, and it fears multipolar blocs. It doesn't want to see Iran uh, strengthen its links with Syria, with Lebanon, with Palestine, for example. But the failures in Iran, or the wars against Iran, the war against Iraq, the war against Syria, the war in Afghanistan, um, the, the, the crippling of the Lebanese society and its economy, and the siege and dirty war on Yemen, they all have all helped build an expanded Middle East and a, an expanded Eurasian role for Russia and China, precisely the opposite to what was intended. Uh, one of the important uh, US voices, former official Lawrence Wilkerson, he was, I think, chief of staff to the late, the, sorry, the former Secretary of State Colin Powell, pointed out that the 20 year long occupation of Afghanistan is not really anything to do with the Taliban or Al Qaeda or Osama bin Laden, who died a decade ago. It's to do with undermining Iran and containing the rise of China and Afghanistan being in close proximity to indeed having a border with West, a small border with Western China is something that actually plays a role in uh, helping obstruct the westward expansion of Chinese infrastructure and also to be in touch with an element of Western China, that is to say the, the extremists in uh, Uyghur extremists who are being used within Syria and may also be a force um, under the influence of Saudi money and Saudi Wahhabism, a destabilizing force against China itself in Western China. So Katz says that the shared vision ideology drives this expansion of this axis, this resistance group. The wars of Syria, Iraq and Yemen have expanded the axis of resistance, um, including expanding the commitment to resist the common enemies of Israel, the US, Saudi Arabia, the Gulf allies and their uh, linked Salafi jihadi groups.
So to sum up, the main points of this long presentation are that Washington's new Middle East wars, all wars of aggression, must be understood within the perspective of the new great game, that Washington fears new uh, power blocks, multipolar power blocks and Eurasian blocks in particular, because it's very concerned about losing its influence in both Europe and Asia and is intervening in the middle of the two continents to try and uh, divide that process, that process of integration. All of the new Middle East wars, interventions and blockades are contrary to post-colonial law and norms, all have been deployed on false pretexts. And the new humanitarian intervention responsibility to protect doctrine was used against Libya, but the abuse of that pretext, a rapid conversion into a regime change operation, has led to a permanent fracture in the UN Security Council with Russia and China opposing new humanitarian intervention and wars um, initially in Syria, but the, in principle, there will be a division on that basis into the future. The most convoluted and sustained pretext in the new Middle East wars were used against Syria because that war has persisted for so long. But when they failed, when the multiple foreign occupations uh, followed um, to try and delay the defeat there, it's clear that the US plan in Syria has been defeated, but there's a delaying process going on, which of course is hurting and trying to starve the Syrian people. Mass terrorism was employed by Washington as a central element of its so-called smart power in Iraq and Syria in particular, but also in Libya and to some extent in Yemen also in Lebanon. But this terrorism was then blamed on US allies with the US trying to still maintain the fiction that it, it itself is not the mastermind of this terrorism. The Arab Spring, so-called of 2011, barely touched the least democratic states of the monarchies of the Persian Gulf or the US client states. The one successful revolution of that period in Yemen was mercilessly attacked and besieged by a US-led bloc. The aggression from Washington has led, however, to the rise of a regional military alliance headed by Iran and with the support of Russia and to a lesser extent China, although there is direct military cooperation with China and Iran. The effect of several losing new Middle East wars has therefore been to catalyze a new strategic and economic Eurasian links, especially between East and West Asia, contrary to the very aims of Washington's plan. And I think finally, it should be said that it's likely in the near future that Washington is going to announce some type of strategic retreat, which will delegate some of this, uh, some of these losing wars to its to subcontractors or some regional players, perhaps reluctantly, to try and redefine boundaries where Washington can try and maintain some of its influence in the region still, similar to the so-called Guam Doctrine in Southeast Asia when the US facing losing wars in Indochina um, made a type of strategic retreat without admitting defeat.